deep below the western wall is an underground world holding the secrets of ancient Jerusalem. Next to some of the most enormous stones ever discovered, there is a sealed up gate. Next to this mysterious gate, you will see Jews praying and crying out to God. What is this place? Why is it so important? Well, today we'll talk about it and we'll talk about other secrets we can find in the Western Wall tunnels. But before we will do that, please don't forget to subscribe to my channel, give a like to this video and hit that bell button. I know I am repeating myself, but guys, this is very important. Every like helps the video and helps to spread this message. So thank you so much to all of you for supporting the channel in this way. With that out of the way, let's begin our episode. If you ever visit the Western Wall Plaza, you will always remember it. There is just something special about this place. When you see people from all over the world opening their hearts and praying to God, it's hard to resist emotions. For Jewish people, this is the most important place in the world. Jewish people pray here because they understand this place is so important to God as he ordered his chosen nation to build a temple in this very spot. The Western Wall reminds us of this reality and is a place where Jews remember this unique relationship with God when he lived among his people. But the Western Wall is not the only reminder of the glorious days when the temple stood in Jerusalem. There is also a hidden world that you can't see if you don't know where to look. What I will show you today will change your perspective on the Western Wall and uncover the secrets hidden under the modern streets of Jerusalem. There is a totally different world that was buried for centuries and only now we can see it again and be amazed by the incredible finds. Today I will take you on a journey to the mysterious world and I will show you its secrets. So, not everybody knows that next to the Western Wall there is an actual synagogue. You can enter the synagogue and see Jewish people studying the Torah and praying. Once you enter the synagogue, you will see that it is under a giant arch. This arch is named after a famous explorer, Charles Wilson, who worked in Jerusalem during the previous century. Now, this arch is probably from an early Islamic age, which connected the Temple Mount with the upper city to the west. Although the arch is from a later period, the pier on which the Wilson's arch rests is still the original Herodian one. This arch in Herod's time was one of the first of series of arches, which formed a bridge to span the Tyropeon Valley below. It linked the Temple Mount with the upper city where the Hashmonian Palace was located and where most of the priestly families lived. The bridge is therefore also known as the Bridge of the Priests. In addition, the bridge supported an aqueduct bringing water from the so-called Solomon Pools near Bethlehem to a huge cistern on the Temple Mount known as the Great Sea. This bridge was connected to one of the gates through which you could enter the Temple Mount from the west. But that's not the most important gate that we will talk about today. Anyways, today above the Wilson's Arch you can see Herod's Masonry. The picture shows the location above today's Wilson's Arch. The gate post of the Gate of Chain is built over two huge stones. These may possibly be the remains of the original Herodian gate, which was built over the Wilson's Arch. In the synagogue next to the Western Wall, you can of course see the beautiful Aaron HaKodesh, which means Holy Ark, where the Torah scrolls are kept. The Ark is the holiest place in the synagogue. The Ark is opened only during special prayers and when removing the Torah to read during prayer services. So this place functions as an actual synagogue, but it's not an ordinary synagogue because it is located in a very special place. If you look closely to the ground of this synagogue, 
you will see shafts covered by glass. As you look through them, you will be amazed at how much stuff is below you. But that's not all. You can actually go down and see what is down there yourself. But before we will do that, let me explain what's going on here. You must understand that the western wall is just a small part of the remains of the retaining wall that we can observe from the west. As I explained in my previous videos, Herod expanded the Temple Mount to accommodate the growing number of pilgrims that were coming to Jerusalem. The western wall is part of this expansion, but it's actually a very small part. It's about 10% of the whole length of the wall that Herod built on the western side of the Temple Mount. This retaining wall continues to the south. You can visit this place by going to Davidson Archaeological Park. Here you can actually see the destroyed parts of this wall, because there are huge stones that remind us of the Roman destruction in AD 70. The Romans pushed the huge stones of this retaining wall below the street and shops that were located below. If you would like to learn more about this, check out my video where I visit the Davidson Archaeological Park. I'm putting a link in the description. But let's continue. The majority of the western wall also continues to the north and it's hidden underground. So about 80% of this wall is hidden and not visible from today's street level of Jerusalem. So how did that happen? Well, first of all, we must understand that the temple platform was not built over a flat area. Because of this, some parts of the wall had to be higher than others to keep the platform level at the top. The parts of the wall in the southern part of the Temple Mount were the tallest, while the parts to the north were the shortest. But the main factor why most of the western wall is underground today is because of the development of Jerusalem after the Roman destruction. The civilization that had the most significant impact on Jerusalem's current level were the Mamluks. The Mamluks were a social class of warrior slaves that came to rule several Middle Eastern territories from the 9th to the 19th century. After the Mamluks, led by Sultan Baibars, took control of Jerusalem in 1267, they began a series of development and restoration projects that aimed to return the city to Islamic control and emphasize its Muslim character. One of their ideas for Jerusalem was so that the inhabitants of the city could live on the same level as the Temple Mount. Thus, they built large supporting arches in much of the Central Valley along the west side of the Temple Mount in order to support houses that were built on top of them. This is why today if you enter the old city from the Lion's Gate you can see that the Temple Mount from this side is the street level. But this is the uniqueness of Jerusalem. When you walk the streets of the old city, you are actually walking on levels of civilizations that are buried underground. We can discover this ancient world today thanks to the hard work of the archaeologists. And let me tell you, what is happening below the western wall is just crazy. Only if you go down there, you can realize how much active archaeological stations there are. They already discovered some amazing stuff, but the work continues and there is still a lot to explore. But before I continue, I want to mention something that you may not realize. The work that is happening under the ground is only possible because Israel won the Six Day War in 1967. Before this conflict, Israel did not have access to East Jerusalem, which was under Jordanian rule. Now, I do not want to spend much time on this, although it's a fascinating story 
and maybe one day I will do an episode about the Six Day War. But basically, one of the significant results of the Six Day War was that Israel regained control of East Jerusalem after almost 2,000 years of exile. This victory allowed the Israeli archaeologists to begin archaeological work around the Temple Mount and this produced many finds that we can appreciate today. If Israel would not win in the Six Day War, perhaps we would never know what we have learned from the digs. So, we are happy that Israel won this war because we can learn so much about ancient history. But I can tell you that the Arab population of Jerusalem is not happy. They are not happy because as more finds prove that there is an ancient connection of the Jewish people to the Temple Mount, the Arab people cannot claim that it belongs to them and only to them. Second, they are not happy because they actually suspect that Israel is weakening the foundations of the Temple Mount through all those archaeological digs. They actually fear that Israel's action will cause the collapse of the Dome of the Rock. Now, this is illogical and the archaeological work is actually done with great attention to safety. But I thought I will throw this information in just to let you know what is happening around the digs under the Western Wall. Okay, so let's go down below the ground and see what is there. To enter the ancient tunnels, you have to buy a ticket from the Western Wall Heritage Foundation. Their office can be entered from the Western Wall Plaza. From here, you go down and instantly you are shocked by the size of the first find. At the beginning of the tunnel that goes along the western wall, you are presented with giant stones. Two of those stones are just enormous and people are still figuring out how Herod workers moved these massive stones. The biggest stone measures 45 feet, that's 13.70 meters long, and 12 feet that's 3.50 meters high. It is estimated to be 16 feet, that's 5 meters wide, and to weigh almost 600 tons. Can you imagine? It weighs almost 600 tons. This is equal to the weight of 200 elephants. That's super heavy. No modern machine would be able to lift such a large stone. People suspect that Herod used stones that large to make the temple platform more stable. So even if an earthquake happened, the huge stones would prevent the structure from collapsing. But still, how did they move them? There are approximately 12 regular stone courses below these huge stone blocks before the bedrock is reached. The holes that you can see in the stones were made at a later date, when a cistern was built in this area. Small projecting stones placed in these holes held the plaster face tightly to the wall. Today, above the massive stones, you have smaller stones that are from the Umayyad period. But what is very interesting is that next to those huge stones, you can also see a mysterious sealed up gate. Now, this is believed to be the Warren's Gate. The Warren's Gate was the northmost of the four ancient gates on the western side of the wall. The arch over the Warren's Gate is of a later time period, but the doorposts are certainly Herodian. Now, this was a very important gate when the temple stood on the Temple Mount. Historian sources indicate that Warren's Gate was used for bringing in wood, sacrifices and other materials used for the sacrificial rites. Today, if you visit the site, you will also see Jewish people praying next to the location of the Warren's Gate. This is a significant place because this gate is the closest to where the Holy of Holies would be located on the Temple Mount. 
Warren's gate has been reconstructed in this model using Parker's gate as a parallel. The lines of small shops that has been discovered along the western wall further to the south probably continued in this area. As the level of the street is still several meters below the sill of the Warren's Gate Street, a stairway has been reconstructed here also to reach the gate from the street. So let me stop here and make a comment. This gate is very significant because it's the closest to the location of the Holy of Holies. When you pass next to this gate, you are actually standing very close to the place where God's presence lived among his people. It is also interesting that this gate and the golden gate are both sealed up. This particular gate is important because it was the gate that was the closest to the Holy of Holies. The golden gate is important because it's the eastern gate through which the glory of God will return to Jerusalem. We read about this in the book of Ezekiel. What a spectacular day it will be when both of those gates will be opened and God's presence will once again live in Jerusalem. But let's continue our journey. As you walk along the western wall towards the northern part of the Temple Mount, you will see some more of Herodian masonry on the way. The stones were cut and fitted together on site. They were put together without mortar or metal clamps, yet they are so tight that it is sometimes impossible to put even a razor blade between the stones. The courses were laid one on top of the other with a slight pyramid effect so that the viewer did not feel like the walls would topple over. The stones are of approximately 1 inch, that's 2.5 centimeters, which eases the psychological discomfort resulting from looking up at the monumental walls. Archaeologists have estimated that if all the Herodian stones, which are secondary use around Jerusalem, were gathered together, almost the entire height of the Temple Mount walls could be reconstructed. As you continue to walk, you will arrive to the Herodian Street level. 65 feet, that's 20 meters, of the Herodian Street have been exposed at the northern end of the tunnel. The top side has a marginal dressing, but still has a rough surface to prevent slippering. The road ends at this point, as do all signs of stone cutting connected with the western wall. Dan Bach dates this end of work to the death of Herod in 4 BC. The street was never completed in this area because of a high broad rock face which the workers were unable to remove. Also, Herodian columns were found along the western side of the street. These columns were made up of several sections and have Doric capitals, typical of the burial structures located around Jerusalem in the Second Temple period. Okay, so as the ancient street from the time of Herod ends here, I would also like to end my video. But before I will do that, I would like to thank everyone who is supporting my work on YouTube and through Patreon. This is a huge privilege for me to share the stories from Israel with you and your support means so much to me. I never dreamed that God will bless this work so much. If you believe that my work is helpful, I also ask you to consider supporting the channel. The best way to do it is through the Patreon page. On my main channel page, there is an icon that if you click it, it will take you directly to the Patreon page. Any amount is greatly appreciated. But don't worry, if you can't support me, this is okay. I will continue this work and produce more videos. I am not here for the money. It just helps to support the channel. Thank you so much for your time. I hope to see you in my next video. And as always, Shalom.